Okay, true confession time. I have a couple of tattoos. <laughs> I've got a lovely one right here on the top of my right arm, and some of you may have seen it. Uh, it's kind of a Celtic knotwork design of a wild goose done in rainbow colors. I think it's pretty. And I got it because you know how in a lot of Christian art and iconography, the Holy Spirit is represented by a bird? Generally a dove, right? Y'all have seen this? Smile and nod at me. And, and, and during communion today, we'll be singing a song. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place and it has a line in it, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove. Anyhow, in Celtic spirituality, which I very much appreciate because of my own Scottish heritage, the Holy Spirit is represented by a wild goose because she cannot be tamed. She's not always necessarily sweet and fluffy. Sometimes the Spirit of God can be a sweet, comforting presence, and sometimes she's an angry Canada goose chasing you. Okay, and that kind of represents how I see the spirit of God working in the world, wild and untamed. The spirit will do what she will do and it is likely to be surprising. So that's, that's the one that some of you may have seen. Now, practically none of you have seen the other one or ever will. <laughs> it's right about here, so I'd have to drop trow, which is probably not gonna happen or be wearing a really high-cut bathing suit, which is definitely never going to happen. <laughs> and what it is, is a bunch of grapes. Now, as an aside, I, I recall a time, oh, probably 30 years ago or so, when the assistant pastor at the MCC church I was attending in Washington, D.C., she got a lovely little rainbow heart right about here. And she decided that if anyone wanted to see it, they had to donate 10 bucks to the church's building fund. <laughs> so one Sunday before church, there was this spectacle <laughs> of the assistant pastor of the church in the ladies' room with her shirt half off, showing her tattoo to a clamoring group of women and a few men in the ladies' room, all waving $10 bills at her. <laughs> picture it. Unfortunately, that was the Sunday that some nice young man had talked his mother into coming to church with him. And when she walked into the ladies' room in the middle of this, it required some explanation. For the record, I will not be doing this after service or at any other time. Although, I suppose if the church got into some really dire financial straits, I might be willing to take one for the team. <laughs> but let's, let's all pray it never comes to that. <laughs> Y'all are just going to have to take my word for it. It's a nice little bunch of purple grapes. And the reason I have it is because of that passage that I read to you all a couple of minutes ago from the Gospel of John. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. So this is me bearing fruit. And someday, when I have a lot of spare cash, ha, huh, I would love to get that tattoo expanded with more grapes and a big grapevine, and I want the vine part of the tattoo, actually, to be that verse in the original Greek, someday. If I ever get that, maybe I'll show it to you all. In the meantime, in the meantime, though, it's a little reminder to me, permanently etched on my body, that my purpose is to bear fruit and a reminder to me to stay connected to, to abide in the life-giving vine, which for me is God. What does it mean to bear fruit? Well, elsewhere in Scripture, in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fruits of the Spirit are described as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it seems to me that these are good things to cultivate in myself. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
And if I knew a person who possessed all these traits, and I am blessed to know many such people, I would want to know them and spend time with them. I would want them to be my friends. I would want them to be a part of this church. And people like that are frankly attractive. They attract people to them. Not necessarily because they're outwardly pretty, but because they have an inner light that people are drawn to. And thankfully, I think this church is just chock full of such people. That would be you all. But to be like that is not always easy in a world that is unloving and depressing and violent and unkind and miserly and faithless and completely out of control. It kind of describes the world sometimes. And that fruit of the spirit, like actual fruit that grows on trees and vines, has to be cultivated in us. And most importantly, it has to be connected. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And a branch that's cut off from the vine is useless. It's not to put too fine a point on it, it's dead. It will achieve nothing. And this is Jesus' way of teaching us that we need to stay connected to God and connected to one another. Early in the chapter, uh, Jesus teaches, I am the true vine and my heavenly parent is the vine grower. And God removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. And every branch that bears fruit, God prunes to make it bear more fruit. And I didn't read that part to you earlier because I didn't want to scare you right away. But it's clear, we are supposed to bear fruit. And we're supposed to do it while connected to God. Because that's really the only way we can do it. As we muddle through our third year of the latest pandemic, I think some of us have gotten sort of comfortable with an increased level of isolation. And some of us, those of us like me who are by nature introverts, have kind of reveled in the opportunity to avoid large or even smaller gatherings of people but there are other people for, for whom this enforced isolation has been the very worst part of the pandemic. And I condemn, especially in the early days of the pandemic, when we had lengthy lockdowns and when we couldn't visit people in hospital or in long-term care homes, I think that isolation and sometimes the depression associated with it killed nearly as many people as COVID did. You know, I think I think in years to come when we look back on this time and we look at the number of what the epidemiologists call excess deaths, not necessarily from COVID, but from the effects of COVID. And certainly those of us who pay attention to what's happening in churches in general have noticed that a lot of people aren't necessarily coming back to in-person services, which is one of the reasons I am really so glad to see all of you here today. Thank you for being here. Um, but I, and for you, those of you who are watching online, believe me, I completely get the temptation to stay home and worship at St. Mattress. <laughs> when, when we were doing church online only, there was even a part of me that kind of enjoyed, you know, getting church all done a few days before Sunday and then getting up or not even getting up at 5 to 11 and watching church in my jammies. Good times. <laughs> Better times here. There's a definite downside to that. We are social people, and we are meant to be in community, and it is foolish and dangerous, especially in these times, to believe in isolation because we cannot thrive on withdrawal. We are a community rooted in relationship. Now, this does not mean that we are always one big happy family. There's an old saying in the Baptist church, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be the glory. To dwell below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. And I will be the first to admit that it is not always easy to relate to people with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to my fellow human beings. But when I realize that they and we are all part of the same living being, branches on the same vine, 
maybe it's easier. Maybe it would be easier if we really understand that the same life force that animates us, our connection to God, is present in and what animates our fellow human beings. You know, I, I started this lesson by talking about my tattoos, and that was just kind of to get your attention, and it worked for a few minutes, it did. <laughs> but I don't want you to go away from here remembering that. That is not what I want you all to remember. What I want us all to remember is that we're a part of God. We are the branches connected to the vine. And what's this connection like? What does it mean to be connected to God and to bring forth fruit? Well, it's not about following rules for good behavior. It's not about accepting a set of church doctrines. It's not about being religious at all. It's about cultivating a passionate, personal, all-consuming relationship with the God who is love. As a branch draws its life from the vine, we as people of faith draw our life from God. And when the life of love, this life in God, flows into us, the way life courses through a grapevine, we experience a change in our lives. We bear fruit. What kind of fruit are we to bear? Well, there's a parable in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus says, every tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. So, fig trees produce figs, thorn bushes produce more thorns, and grapevines produce little grapes. And a body of loving, committed people of faith will produce other loving, committed people of faith. That's bearing fruit. You know, ever since I took on the role of being acting senior pastor here. People have been coming up to me to offer advice, and I appreciate that. Generally, it's advice on what this church really needs, and I listen. I pay attention. One week, someone told me that what this church needs is more young people, and they're right. And another week, someone told me that I need to concentrate on the older folks who are, all, who are so faithful about supporting the church and show up every week. And they're also right. And like any farmer who grows grapes or wheats or apples or cucumbers, what folks really want to see is growth. And we want that too, don't we? We want to see growth in this church. But there's another, another perspective that I think we need to have. There's another kind of growth that I think we need to cult cultivate. And I'm right too. Each one of us needs to grow in the spirit of God, the spirit of love, and we need to bear those fruits of love and commitment and discipleship in our lives. And that creates in us a kind of love and joy and peace that irresistibly draws others to us. Because as Reverend June said, we can't be church unless we do it together. You know, I, was, I, I pastored a, a church one time where we... Um, we were going to paint the sanctuary, and uh, I got a lot of advice then, too. Um, and, you know, there were some people who were just adamant, you know, well, we can't use this color or that color, and other folks who, well, it's got to be this color or that color, uh, and we need to get professionals in here. And finally, I said to one of those people, I said, it is way less important that we, that we do it perfectly than it is to do it together more important to do it together than to do it perfectly. And I always say, if it were perfect, it wouldn't be MCC. My prayer for MCC Toronto is that every one of us will be so close, so connected to the vine, that people will see that fruit in our lives and be drawn to God's unconditional, passionate, eternal, irresistible love. Amen. Thank you.